Hi, and thanks for joining us on this week's episode of the Retirement Readiness Podcast. As always, we have Tim Reagan, the founder here at well at Prairie View Wealth Partners. Hey, Katie. Hi, and I'm Katie Umland, the uh, head of marketing here. Um, so this is something we've talked about many times, um, ins and outs throughout the podcast, but just wanted to, to devote um, a specific episode um, about 10 things to look for in a financial planner. So, so you first don't answer get Tim off. Reagan, or, right? Is that, oh, oh wait, no, <laughs> yeah. no that, 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 is that too self-serving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah number start, one is uh, not look uh, for Tim Reagan. Yeah, yeah, so the number one, start Googling Prairie View Wealth Partners. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I guess maybe as the head of marketing, I should be encouraging it, but no. <laughs> no, you're not. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but there are a top 10, top 10 things to look for um, when we're talking about a financial advisor. Um, and so, Tim, I think you can kind of take us through them. Uh, we can just start with the first one being probably the most important or one of the most important is fiduciary. Yeah. Well, and I think maybe even before we go there, uh, we should probably talk about you know, what even what, when somebody says financial advisor or financial planner or investment advisor or insurance agent or, you know, like there's a whole slew of things that are being they talked feel about. feel interchangeable, but they're not. And yeah, you... how, where do I even start with all of that? Right. And so what we're going to talk about today is probably what does it look like to find a financial planner? Okay. Uh, many times people will, talk, will interchange, like you said, they all look kind of the same. They'll interchange financial planner, financial advisor, and those are probably the closest to be interchanged. But you find a lot of people that, uh, that maybe don't qualify or qualify maybe as a poor choice words, but they don't truly embody financial planning. Uh, but yet maybe I work in an investment world and I only offer investments to my clients, but I call myself a financial advisor. Uh, or maybe I, I sell life insurance and so I call myself a financial advisor. Or I'm a TikToker and I... Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, have uh, seen some YouTube videos, so yeah, I yeah. call myself a financial advisor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and so so what we'll really talk about is what is what should you look for when you're looking for a financial planner? And a financial planner is somebody who's going to try to look at your holistic... Uh, or your world in a holistic way and really try to say, what are you trying to accomplish? And then how do we put all of the pieces together? Not just your investments, but how do we look at what are the tax ramifications? How do we look at, do you have any gaps in and have some risk? Like you need some insurances. How do we look at estate, planning. estate plan? Yeah. You go, just go down the list and, and estate planning sounds fancy, uh, but really it just means where does my stuff go? If I, something happens to me. Right. And so, uh, so it really is kind of financial planning is kind of this holistic look. And, and that's why we like to start with fiduciary. Uh, so w let's go back and say, for Prairie View Wealth Partners, what would you, would you say financial planning is the mo is the best way to describe Prairie View or what, what would you, what of those <laughs> yeah. slew of things we called out? Yeah. So I, my personal opinion is that through the financial planning process, that's where we provide the most value. Um, it's really easy to, uh, and, and maybe I'll, I'll pick building a house as the example. If I want to build a house, I know lots of people that are extremely talented at carpentry, extremely talented at electrical work, extremely talented at plumbing. Uh, and if, and if I wanted to, I could bring them in piecemeal and I could say, build me a room and they would start working and I'm sure it would come out well. But it would come out maybe much different if I started by sitting down with somebody and said, "Here's let's talk about the type of house that I want. Let's dream what is possible and let's come up with what my needs are. And then let's go out and get the carpenter and the electrician. And the uh, and so when you're looking at financial planning and especially how Prairie View does it, the way that you get the most value is when we can help you to truly understand what legacy it is that you're trying to live. And then we can match up the right electrician, like right plumber, and and make that all kind of come together. And and that's that's really where we provide the most value. Could somebody call up and say, "Hey, would you just help me manage my portfolio?" Yes, we can do that. We do a great job with it. But but we're it works the best is when we can say, "Yeah, but that portfolio is linked with your desire to retire, your desire to send the kids to school." And so we're, we're managing those funds probably very specifically for those goals, versus just can we, can you make us some money with it? So so it's kind of. All, I'm just, I'm not asking you this to like plug Prairie View. I'm asking so that clients can kind of put it together in their head and say, yeah. okay, I am a client of Prairie View. I would have said Tim is my wealth advisor. Sure. Or I would have said Tim is my financial planner. Um, 
and so just trying to make sense of like, what does that actually mean? Because we also do have insurance, Mm -hmm. you know, we also can't help with insurance and estate planning. So it is kind of yeah, well, and, and absolutely it is. And to your point, you know, the, uh, we're not unique in that. So this isn't necessarily plugging Prairie View because there's lots of firms that, that can do that. Uh, but what what we can do is the way that we like to think about it is there's there's a couple of different parts to it. The first part is designing the plan. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, is designing the plan, really coming up with what's the outcome that we're looking for. The second piece then is how do I implement that? So there are in this business, there are people that are pure financial planners where all they really do is write the plan. And they'll tell you, you need to have this much in life insurance. You need to save this much in your investments. Uh, We've done some tax planning, estate planning, and they'll just write that plan. And that's all they do. And then the client can take that and walk out the door and say, okay, I'm going to call my investment advisor at XYZ company okay. and and help, tell them what I want to do. So I'm the going client to, is like the general contractor. Exactly. Uh-huh. And getting all of their outsourced materials and a financial planner is the general contractor that has all of these. Yeah. So I, I kind of like to think about it like in that scenario, the financial planner that they went to talk to that just drew up the plan is the, is the architect, right? They, okay, they drew sure. the house and now it's up to somebody else to go figure out how do I get the house built, uh, where where there are other people that kind of like that first analogy that I used that say we're the people that can build the house, but we only build specific pieces to that house. Mm-hmm. We do the carpentry work. We do the, and so many times as that client leaves that financial planner with this plan, they're going to go and talk to an investment person or they're going to go talk to an insurance person, and those people have expertise in those areas. Um, and then they'll help them to implement that plan that the, the planner put together. Uh, where the the approach that we think is the best approach is the approach that kind of brings those things together and says, you go to the place that's going to design the house, draw the house, but they can also then take that plan and implement that plan from A to Z. Um, and that's really the, the role that Prairie View plays is saying, how do we not only help you to implement like some do, or not only help you to draw it up like some do, but really how how do we help you from A to Z? And like I said, that's uh, that's our point of view. That's where we think that you get the most value uh, is is if you have a company that does that for you. Sure, but every, like you said, everybody has their own value proposition. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so fiduciary. Um, I always feel like that's like a word I shouldn't say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, really, it's, I just it, learned what this, what yeah. this means from you. You taught well, me. And it's super, <laughs> it, it sounds like super official, right? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. like a word that's like, I don't know. It just seems like I would never actually say this word in real life yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't know anything about. <laughs> well, I, I had somebody tell me one time that that's why uh, a lot of times lawyers put Latin in contracts. Mm-hmm. So just so that like, you would think like, oh, I can never be a lawyer. <laughs> like, yeah. like, so, I, I, I could never do be a fiduciary like, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. when really all it means is that uh that we have to put your best interests at the heart of every decision that's made uh so when we talk about kind of the difference between what somebody that is uh maybe offering just investment advice sometimes those those investment that in that world you can be a fiduciary sometimes you're not and so there are people then that if you're not a fiduciary i just have to make sure that what i'm offering to you is suitable. I don't have to make sure that it's the best option for you. Mm. And when when somebody acts as your fiduciary, they have to make sure that they're offering you the best that's available uh, for you in your situation and in those kinds of things. They have to put you at the heart of all of those decisions. And so we do. I mean, if you're looking for a new advisor, uh, a financial planner, make sure they're fiduciary. Make sure that that their decisions are or their offerings are in your best interest. And how would you know if they're fiduciary? Yeah. So the um, easiest one, ask them, right? Okay. I mean, that's super easy. Otherwise, uh, if you're not sure, uh, you can go and look on their website and, and start to see, are they a certified financial planner? The CFP designation requires you to act in a fiduciary capacity. Uh, do they have, what licenses do they have? And are they offering their product as a product for sale or are they offering advice as a way to to help you implement your plan? So, okay, um, so that's number one. Number two is trust. Um, so it seems obvious, but why is this important for a relationship? So uh, it's funny because when you talk about trust, there's a lot of different kinds of trust. Like right now, 
I could trust Katie that I would put my wallet on the table and you won't steal it. I know that. Uh, I could put my wallet on the table. I could leave it there. I could leave for three weeks and it would still be sitting there, right? I trust you that you're not going to rip me off. But I would not trust you to fix my car. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, when, when I ask you what kind of car do you like and you say the, the, the blue black one. one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I would not trust you to pull out the wrenches and start working on my car. Uh, so there's knowledge, trust, and personal exactly. trust. Exactly, yeah. And so when you sit down and you talk with that advisor, that uh, planner, you have to make sure that you trust them. That you, you, If you have any sense that the advice they're giving you is really just a way to get into your wallet, that's not the right kind of trust, right? You have to trust them on the first way that I can leave you, all of my money with you and I never have to worry about you trying to, to get into that. The second layer of trust, though, has to be they're competent. I trust that they know what they're talking about. I can listen to their advice because the at the end of the day, if you're not going to implement the advice that they're giving you, it's you're pointless. wasting everybody's time. Yeah. Uh, and so there has to be both sides of that trust. Uh, also, as, as an aside, you shouldn't trust me to fix your car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was going to say, well, yeah, well, I don't trust you to pick out my clothes. So <laughs> it goes both ways. Both ways. <laughs> um, number three on this list is understanding. Um, so what does it mean to have an understanding with your advisor and why is it important in this relationship? Yeah. So it, again, that's a two kind of multi-layer piece. Uh, so uh, Katie, what's one of the things that you say all the time when you're here, when we start talking about RMD and IRA and <laughs> like, QCD? Wait, 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 and... wait. I don't understand that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? You're like, uh, back up. And so, uh, I just want to clear the air. I know what all of those things are that you just said. <laughs> per stirpes, know that one too. Yep. Hey. <laughs> yeah, and, and so on one side, it's understanding that the my advisor is talking to me in a way that I understand. Uh, many times advisors can get caught up in jargon, caught up in, and which is fine if, as long as the person they're talking to knows what that means. And so one layer of understanding has to be just the pure, you're saying words and I understand those words. The other side of that though, is that that advisor has to understand you. Uh, they have to understand where are you coming from? What are you trying to do? Um, because if that's not in alignment, you're going to, you know, what's that old saying that if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if the advisor doesn't know that they could be taking you down a road that really isn't where you want to go. And so that understanding really falls into both of those. Like, categories. wait, wait, wait. I thought I was retiring at 50 and not having to work part time, but yes. you're under the impression that I'm retiring at 60 and I am working part time. Exactly. Like, yeah. Let's like, sure. let's make sure we got a clear <laughs> understanding yeah. of, yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Um, so values is, is up next and again, seems a little obvious, but what values should we be looking for? And that doesn't mean values on your statement, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. That's important, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> but really the values are that, that you have to be in alignment. Um, you don't necessarily have to share all of the same values, but you should share some. So for example, uh, for us here at Prairie View, our values are that we are Christian. And so just about everything that we do all the decisions that we make when we sit down with clients is with the idea that everything we have was a gift from God. And so if that's the, and, and so we believe in stewardship, we believe in good stewardship with our funds. Uh, if those are values that you espouse to, then that makes sense. But if you come in and your point of view is uh, not that, your point of view is maybe, I don't believe that there is a God or there, we're probably not going to jive real well uh and not like a we'll close the door on you but just it doesn't it probably just doesn't have that great relationship exactly and, and you know that right every time you go into a party and you start talking to them you have a great conversation yep. for an hour and you're like oh have we just been talking to each other for an hour yeah like that's... we just become best friends yeah exactly <laughs> uh, which happens to me like all, all the, the time, time. <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but but it's like in those in those cases it's because usually because you have a lot of the same points of view on things and so when you talk about values, uh, it can even go to, like we, we've we talked in the past about our value proposition at our house looks much different than uh, the value proposition that maybe you and Alex have. And mm -hmm. so it's just making sure you're in alignment with some of those core values. Um, and like you said, um, having similar values, so you have similar points of view, but that doesn't mean, hey, I'm coming in to say, this is what I think should happen. And I... Ex I hope or want you to agree with me because that doesn't oh, always, oh, 100%, like, that's yep. not why you're here <laughs> either. Oh, like. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Well, and, and even it's funny because uh, we have, I would say some of our best clients 
are as far right on the political spectrum as you could think. And then some of our best clients are as far left on the political spectrum. as you. So it, it's not even though when we talk about points of view, it's not even necessarily that point of view, but it really comes down to the core values around what am I trying to accomplish in my life and mm -hmm. can this person help me? So for example, if one of my core values is that I want to be philanthropic and I want to help uh, charities and I want to give away as much money as I can. But when you go to talk to your financial advisor and that advisor is all about how do we grow your pot to be the biggest that it can be, mm -hmm. probably not in alignment with the values that you have. And so the advice that they give is going to come with a different headset on than, yep. than what you maybe came into that conversation with. So so values are important. And neither is right or wrong. No, it's just, no, it's what just different. You yeah. just making sure that, that you know what their where their intentions are. Absolutely. Um, okay. So credentials. So this is a big one. Um, don't all advisors have to have licenses and yeah, for sure. So there, there's a huge difference between, uh, selling a product or offering a product for sale, which all advisors have to have a license to sell the things that they're selling to you. And what that license will do is that license will show a certain amount of, uh, technical knowledge that they've, the, the state or the federal government, or whomever is overseeing that, they check the box and got a certain amount of knowledge. What designations are is they're the, they're the letters that come after an advisor's name. And all those do is they just say that they went on for some additional accreditation uh, to make sure that they're showing that they are professional and, and those things. So the things that we tell people to look for are like, especially your CFP, which stands for Certified Financial Planner. Uh, that's kind of the gold standard in our industry. There's lots of others that are really good. I'm not downplaying those. But just look to make sure that there's at least some alphabet soup after the advisor's name. Otherwise, it might indicate that they're not as vested in this career and not really looking to be a professional at it if they're not looking to advance some of their professional designations. Sure. And that can be like a team approach. Somebody on the team, 100%. the CFP, doesn't mean that 100%. you know who you're meeting with has to be CFP. No, so, you absolutely. Know, sometimes it's a bigger... Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Org chart to the... Yeah. Well, and to your point with that, uh, you know, it's also about finding the right layer or the right level of advisor to be with. You know, if I'm just starting out, I'm fresh out of school and I'm working on that first job, working to build a, an emergency fund, pay down some student loans, you know, kind of just getting started, working with a CFP is overkill. Mm -hmm. uh, you should really be working with somebody that matches you and where you're at in your life stage. Uh, but on the flip side... If I'm trying to sell businesses and uh, retire with, you know, gobs of money and do all this stuff that's really pretty complicated, I really shouldn't be working with my buddy's kid who just got out of, you know, got his licenses type of a thing, right? So it's, it really is matching up what you're, what you're trying to do. And I guess this comes later. Number nine is teamwork. Um, and I makes think- Makes the dream work. Yeah. <laughs> Lame. Um, but that kind of makes me think about this. Two, um, and I don't even know if this is exactly where we're going with teamwork. It can mean a couple different things, but to to say that somebody on your advisory staff should be CFP. 100%. It doesn't have to be, like when we say Prairie View Wealth Partners, it's Prairie View Wealth Partners. It's not Tim Reagan yep. is always your advisor. Um, and it, it depends on what kind of meeting you have. You know, it depends on what you're looking to talk about, who the best um advisor is for that meeting. You absolutely. know, it's a team. It's not just one advisor always. So yeah, it, no, can be, you're it can absolutely be a little right. bit of both. Yep. Absolutely. Um, okay. So number six is regulators. And the only thing that I think of regulators is like regulators. <laughs> so what, what does that mean? Yeah. So, so what, uh, when you think about a regular regulator, uh, really it is, those are the people that make sure that advisors are doing what they should be doing. Uh, and so, the FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, uh, monitors advisors and makes sure that they're doing what they should be doing. And not for what they're doing, what they should be doing as far as giving good advice, but meaning playing within the rules and the, the boundaries which, with which we uh, have to live. And in our industry, we're like the most regulated industry, I think, in the world mm -hmm. almost. Uh, and so one of the things that we tell everybody, it is free, it is easy, uh, Type in your Google search, broker check, uh, and when you do, it'll come up with a search on FINRA's site. You can type in the person that you're thinking about doing business with, type in their name, and it will come up with all kinds of information. It will show you where have they been licensed at before, what, what's their work history, 
uh, it'll tell you have there ever been any customer complaints uh, and not customer complaints like you know, a bad Google review. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> it's customer complaints where, hey, this person didn't execute something that I thought they were going to execute on, and it cost me money. Um, and that's not to say that if somebody has something in their past that was a negative block or you know a mark on their record, doesn't mean that oh I got to stay, stay away. away. Um, but it but it's Look just into it. additional information. That that's yeah. right. Uh, but maybe somebody who has one every six months, uh, maybe that's somebody we want to you know be be a little more careful with. So uh, so just make sure they have a clean regulatory history and that that it makes sense that it's logical and it kind of adds up to the person you want to trust. Cool. Um, next is compensation. Is it okay to talk about how your advisor is getting paid? Yeah. Uh, every time somebody asks us, we say hopefully a lot, <laughs> right? As, as much as we can, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but it is, you know, it used to be like, taboo, like, oh, you don't talk money. No, you need to know. You need to understand what that compensation structure looks like. Uh, and any advisor that is a fiduciary, any advisor that is really, truly looking to be a partner, anybody who understands you, anybody you can trust should have no problem having that conversation with you uh, and, and helping to explain at least the structure. Because, you know, I think a lot of times when I go in to buy something, uh, it would help me to know if the person on the other end of that conversation is getting paid if I buy yep. or if they're not, or, you know, it just, it helps me. So even I on Instagram, right. you have to say that you're paid for this. This is an yeah. ad, paid advertisement. Like if you're following somebody. hundred percent. Yeah. And so there's no reason why you shouldn't be, feel comfortable to have that conversation with your advisor. You're going to have more intimate conversations with that advisor than probably almost anybody else in the world. Uh, so it's good that everybody knows, you know, what's the platform by which we're coming into the conversation. Um, okay. So let's talk about technology. Um, specifically, what if a client's not super tech savvy. What does it mean if your advisor's not tech savvy? Yeah. So this is like a huge space right now. Uh, and, and it's funny because as advisors, we have everybody from like, I have everything on my phone. It's an app and I'm constantly updating and watching to clients that have don't flip phones me. and I yeah. don't even have an email. <laughs> so, uh, so really when we look at technology, uh, it falls in, in a lot of different categories. One is do they have the technology that is today, current, cutting edge? Uh, is it going to, and, and even if I'm the type that is not the technology person, that's okay. But if your advisor doesn't have those tools, it might indicate that they are not actively in the business and actively able to take advantage of the newest things that are, are in our industry. Uh, so that's just kind of a a check back, right? This mm -hmm. person seems like they're really on top of it. It seems, but wait a minute, you're still like back in you know 1992. Well, maybe then it's it's just a, a place to kind of check. But also, the way technology is today, your advisor should be able to meet you where you want to be met with that. Mm -hmm. And so, if you are super uh, into tech and you want to be able to have it on your phone and see your financial plan on your phone and be able to see what your account balances are at the drop of a hat and your advisory firm should be able to do that. Uh, they should be able to have a portal that you can upload all of your sensitive documents and not have to worry about snail mailing them or uh, sending them in a non-secure way via via uh, electronic communication. So they should be that, but it should also be on the other end of the spectrum to where that advisor should be able to, in a personal face-to-face -face meeting, take whatever tech they're using and bring it to the level that you can understand it helps enhance your experience uh, not be something that's overwhelming. So like when we went to mom's last night and mom said, Oh good, Alex, you're here. <laughs> Which we always, <laughs> Oh, you know where that's going. Yeah. Yeah. Something so, with her so phone wait, or her so iPad. When, when you say mom's, <laughs> that we should continue to let people oh, know that yeah, we're you are my sister. sister. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so we know that well. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So we kind of briefly touched on teamwork. Um, so what, why would teamwork be important? Yeah, so teamwork is super important. And it's both teamwork from your part of the team, right? This is your plan. Right. Well, you, you have need to buy in too. Yeah, and you have to feel like you're just as valued at that table as anybody else. And, and if nothing else, you're more valued because this is your plan. So you have to feel like you're part of the team. Uh, but beyond that, today's world is so complex that you cannot expect to have one advisor, a solo advisor, have no support, and that they're going to be able to serve you as well as, as possible. Now, again, we say that there are some people that, like I said, maybe just graduated high school or graduated college, have the school debt, have the, and they're like, I need somebody, but I don't need all of that, right? Mm -hmm. I, but eventually you will. 
And, and so to have a team that can come together and say, okay, when we're talking about social security planning, we have somebody that they know they that inside. The That's right. Yeah. When we're doing what if tax planning at the end of every year, we have somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, or like our next topic on stump the chump tax loss harvesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, no, stump the chump. You're Are the you chump. Call, oh, yeah. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> this, I'm easily stumped. Just be the chump. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so you want to look for that team and how do, how does that team come together? And specifically, you know, how am I interacting with that team? So for example, uh, I'll use us just because I know our system. You know, you need to know who is your customer service representative. And when you call in that person, you should have a relationship with that person. They should know you just like your advisor knows you. And and sometimes people think, well, I just want to call and talk to my advisor. The problem with that is the advisor many times might not be available. The turnaround time might not be what it should be. You get and better service talking exactly. to somebody else because they have, that is their lane. That's yes. what they do. Well, but, and Katie, you've seen enough times that this chump, when I'm talking <laughs> to clients, will be like, oh yeah, we need to do X, Y, or Z. And I'm like, uh, uh, let me transfer you back to Rachel. <laughs> yeah, uh, that is way over my pay grade. I do not know how to do that. So let's get you somewhere else. And so a lot of times when you look at that team, you it what what it means is it usually means that I get lower cost because everything is not running through a CFP. It's like if I go to the doctor, uh, I don't want to talk to the surgeon every time. Right. Because if I have to pay surgeon rates, that's not a good thing, right? Uh, you don't want to pay talk to the surgeon to pay your bill. Exactly. Like, well, <laughs> or and, to get scheduled. Yeah, or... <laughs> yeah. And, and then you would think like, if I'm talking to him to pay the bill and to get scheduled, uh, does yeah, he really know he... he's... Yeah. And so you do want a team and you want a team that's well-rounded. Um, okay, so number 10, the last one on the list is long-term relationship. Um, so why should we be thinking long-term? Yeah. Um, even if you're, <laughs> maybe you don't have long-term. <laughs> 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 uh, we've had some of those. <laughs> maybe if you're already. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny because on that end of the spectrum, we do have people that are like uh, ending towards, getting closer towards the end of their time here. And uh, they'll be like, uh I've been doing this my entire life, but I need somebody that can step in and take over for me mm -hmm. and ultimately to help my kids, kids. when exactly. something happens. And and so a lot of times, like even when we were talking about that college grad, uh, you don't want to get in the middle of telling your life story to an advisor, getting down a path, and then realize in a year or two, this advisor doesn't offer the breadth of everything I'm going to need, or this advisory firm isn't able to... Uh, do the planning that I want or have the tech that I want or, you know, the on this whole list of things. Or the advisor themselves is 65. Yep. Getting ready to getting retire. Getting retire. And, and there isn't a successor that you've yep. been introduced to or. Absolutely. And so when you think about all those things, the, the reason that people have advisors is so that that advisor can get to know them, understand them, give them good advice. Uh, and the best advice comes from a deep understanding of who those people are. And so if your advisory firm doesn't have a long-term plan uh, in your mind, then they probably should fall off the list because this is not something you're doing for a one and done. I want to or... start over every year and a half. No, exactly. Exactly. And I almost think about it kind of like, uh, like pastors um, for anybody who knows us, you know, being, having that Christian background. A lot of times I think about with my kids, with Lily, our oldest just got married a year, less than a year ago in July will be a year. Uh, and when she did, it was kind of cool because the pastor that baptized her, uh, was the pastor that married Sarah and I, and it's the same pastor was able to marry her and having that longevity, having that history made that time so much more rich because he had the history, he had the knowledge and the background and, and we had the relationship. And this is a relationship that's probably going to be even more integral than having that, that relationship, mm -hmm. because we're going to be talking about absolutely everything inside of your life, your hopes, your dreams, your goals, your fears, and and what your money is. And then to have somebody that can help to to shepherd that from you, maybe to your kids one day, uh, or maybe it's your spouse and, you know, somebody passes away and they need a spouse to help. So it really is a long-term, long-term deal. Um, yeah, I agree. Okay. So that was 10, um, long, 
winded ways of saying <laughs> what you should look for in a financial okay, so, plan. So let's make, it, let's make it quick. Yeah. So it is fiduciary, trust, understanding, values, credentials, regulators, compensation, technology, teamwork, and a long-term relationship. Top 10. Top 10. Awesome. Well, hopefully, hopefully you found some value in this. Um, if you have further questions or want to chat further, feel free to send us a note. If you have a question you want to try to stump this chump with, um, send it over, <laughs> send it over to us. Um, but please like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you see our most updated episodes. Um, and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Be well. <laughs>